Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Southwest Harbor Public Library's virtual uh, lecture series. I am Dennis Swint. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to share with everyone that the library is continuing its curb service and is now open for walk-in browsing and service. Be sure to check our June exhibition of quilts from quilters here around the island. In two weeks, we will welcome Rebecca Milliken, who will talk about her no new book, Gaining Ad Attitude, Retirement and Beyond. You can sign up in the library's website. Our presentation this evening is being recorded and will be available on the library's YouTube channel within the next few days. I'm uh, pleased to introduce John Anderson and his new book, Born on the Wind, The Life and the Journals of, Andres Andr of Captain Andrus Anderson. Captain Anderson was a Maine schooner captain during the last decade of the Atlantic sailing trade. Of the many attributes of, Dr. of Captain Anderson were his meticulous journals that recorded near-death experiences, he was shipwrecked four times, to the mundane life on a coastal schooner. His journals passed from his family to John Anderson, his grandson. With this remarkable record of over 35 years of life at sea, John Anderson took on the project of telling his grandfather's stories, stories of the American archetype that no longer exist. John Anderson grew up in Rockland, Maine, diagonally across the street from his grandfather's home. John walked the same streets and passed the same places. He heard his grandfather's voice through his family members, through artifacts, and especially his journals. Questions and answers will be taken at the end of this presentation. So please join me now in welcoming John Anderson. Thank you very much, Dennis, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. It's uh, such a pleasure for me to be here in Southwest Harbor where so many of the interesting people of my family originated and to share the story of my grandfather, Captain Andrews Anderson. Uh, and even though it is a story about his life and times, um, I think he also represents all of those captains and his wife and children, the families that supported them over all the, the decades of the 19th century and the early decades of the 20th century. Um, so I hope that in telling his story, we will in a, way, in a way bring back to life both these people and these times for us to uh, appreciate um, what they lived through. There's a wonderful quote by uh, Admiral Arleigh Burke, where he described what it takes to be a, a seagoing uh, person. Neither timid nor reckless men should go to sea. And I think that captures beautifully the, the remarkable combination of temperament, personal characteristics, skills, and attitudes that these folks who sailed the waters of the Atlantic needed to have. My grandfather was born the firstborn son of a firstborn son to a wealthy farming family in the beautiful farmland of Southern Sweet. Under normal circumstances, he would have looked forward to taking over the family farm uh, where they lived in quite a good deal of opulence. They had uh, uh, servants and maids, um, but they, he was also unlucky to be born in the decades where the worst um, recession in Swedish history began. And during the the first 10 years of his life and the three or four decades that followed, nearly a quarter of the population of Sweden um, left Sweden out of economic uh, desperation and came to the United States. Living where he did in southern Sweden, though, he wasn't just immersed in the farming uh, environment. He lived within sight of the Baltic Sea. So he had a duality in his life of both the sea and the land. And at some point in his youth, in his early teenage years, he he was drawn to the sea and trying out the life of a sailor. So at the age of only 16, he went to Malmo and uh, joined the crew of a Swedish bark that uh, traded worldwide. And as he described in later years, when he arrived on the dock, the captain and the crew were so, dis as he put it, disgusted by his stature, he was barely five feet tall, um, that they demanded that he prove his mettle by climbing to the top of the mainmast and putting his cap upon the ball. 
which having been a boy who grew up climbing trees and climbing church steeples, he did with ease. And so they decided they, they'd take a chance on this undersized teenager. Um, over the next five and a half years, he sailed most of the world's oceans. Um, and in those five years, he saw from a distance through letters and a few occasional visits home, the slow economic dissolution and personal dissolution of his family fortune. In, in 1881, he received a letter while he was in America, actually, from his 15-year-old sister advising him that his 42-year-old uh, father had died unexpectedly, which cast his mother into a very tenuous position because in the patriarchal society of Sweden in those days, a woman had no legal or financial standing separate from her husband or a male guardian. Um, and the next year, the, his beloved grandparents both died. So all of these things taken together created a very dire strait for the family. So he was compelled to send whatever money he could home to uh, take care of his mother and his seven younger siblings. In, at the end of December uh, in 1882, he was shipwrecked off the coast of Mallorca in Spain, be the first of four uh, shipwrecks that he would survive. Um, some other notable lowlights or, or highlights. In June of 1885, he was left in, with a tropical fever in a hospital in Rangoon, Burma. And in his papers, we also found a letter from another young Swedish seaman um, addressed to that seaman's mother introducing Captain, uh, in introducing Anders Anderson as the friend and shipmate who would explain to the mother what had happened to her son. And uh, I, we take comfort from the fact that that letter was still in his paper, it's hoping that they both survived uh, their illness. And uh, once he had recovered, he made his way on his own to Calcutta, India and signed on with an English ship. Um, on the way to South uh, Africa, uh, that captain of that ship uh, killed himself. Um, and uh, as they left South Africa on their way to Brazil, they thought, well, nothing worse can happen, I guess. But once they got to Brazil and they loaded up the ship with steel rails, they headed north toward New York off the coast of northern South America. They encountered incredible seas, which buffeted the ship terribly and created leaks that they were barely able to control. They had the young uh, sailors on 36 hours duty, constantly working the pump. And the wife of the uh, captain would bring food and water down to them. They were actually sleeping at the pumps, built robotically uh, working the mechanism. And they managed to limp into the Caribbean where they could go to a port. And when they did, they found that the steel rails had chafed to within a quarter of an inch of breaching the hull. Of course, would have sunk the ship into the deep waters of the, of the um, South Atlantic. Um, another interesting uh, but nerve-wracking trip they had was... Uh, bringing dynamite, uh, a load of dynamite from Morocco to Wales for the uh, mining industry. And you can only imagine how relieved those men must have been when the last load of dynamite was taken off the vessel. Um, while he was uh, approaching the end of these five and a half years, he received word that his mother was in fact, after all of the appeals, was going to lose the farm. So he went back home. And at some point before this, he had apparently made the decision that he was going to take his fortunes on Australia and go there to become a sheep farmer where he could make uh, an economic opportunity that he felt was not possible in Sweden. So when he got home, um, he, he found that his, all of his siblings were going to be farmed out to aunts and uncles or to work as laborers on farms. His own mother, who had grown up in four generations of luxury, um, had to take uh, jobs as a maid in, um, in wealthy Swedish homes. But it was a very dire and sad time for that family. So as he set off to emigrate from Sweden, uh, he was, as I said, intending to go to Australia. He thought he might not be back ever or for a long time. So he took a photo of, had a photo taken of himself to leave with his loved ones. And this is that photo at 22 years of age. Um, and as he left to go to the, to the dock, his mother pressed into his hands a small pocket um, New Testament the hope that that would protect his, uh, him morally and physically on the dangers of the life ahead of him. So uh, he went to London, thinking that's where he could get on a, on a vessel as a working crewman to Australia. But there was such a glut of crewmen that he waited weeks and weeks and could not get on. So finally, in desperation, he signed on to the 
um, Swedish uh, schooner, a Swedish bark, I should say, Oscar II, uh, traveling light or with no, without cargo uh, to St. John, New Brunswick. And as he wrote in a later account of it, after a very rough passage of 50 days, uh, they arrived in St. John. Now, in those days, the crossing of the Atlantic was 18, 19, 20 days, perhaps. So if you can imagine 50 days, that's, that's quite extraordinary. And he had clearly had quite enough of that vessel and or the captain when he arrived, because he wrote in his description, I left her at midnight as a deserter, which other than being a great uh, country music song title, uh, I think indicates that uh, it was a rough, rough experience. But in the previous five and a half years, we know from his accounts that he wrote ye years later that he had crossed the Atlantic at least 11 times during that time. And it's entirely possible it might have been even as many as 15. Um, but that would be his, that would be his last. Um, he quickly got a job working as a, uh, as a crewman on an American three, three masted schooner. And over the next year, he worked on a multitude, you know, probably seven or eight different captains, all American, along the East Coast of the United States. That was his first real exposure to captains other than the rather haughty Sw uh, Swedish and British captains, where there was a very non-democratic and very sort of um, uh, socially conscious demarcation between the crew and the captain. Where it was is with the American captains, he fell in love with the democracy of it and the, the humanity of it. And uh, he, some point during that year, he decided he wasn't going to Australia. He wanted to become an American. So he needed to have a fixed place of residence. So his last captain was a native of Stonington, um, Green's Landing at that time. So in September of 1887, this captain helped him get set up with a job in the quarries um, working on Crotch Island. And he, he stayed there about two years, um, but a, a sailor with his skills was in high demand in Stonington. So he had a cheerful and uh, welcoming personality. He was intelligent. His language was, English language was getting better and he did not drink. Uh, so he developed a reputation even in those two years as being a dependable, good guy. So he had many offers to go back to sea and in 1889, he did. And he became a ship's captain uh, just the next year even though he was not yet a US citizen, uh, which I think was technically not uh, okay, but somehow I, I guess they trusted his skills. And for the rest of his life in his journals, and in addition to a, a few other important personal details, he always noted April 22nd, 1893, the day I was naturalized an American citizen in Ellsworth. And interestingly, when he, when he declared his citizenship, he had to renounce his loyalty to the King of Sweden, Oscar II, which was also the name of the ship that had brought him in that terrible 50-day bouncy crossing uh, to North America. So it was quite... Uh, in Stonington, his uh, gregarious, friendly personality um, quickly won him a lot of friends, and he was invited into the Masons. And this for him was a turning point on his road to becoming an American. Um, and this is him on the right with a couple of his buddies uh, in Stonington. During this time in the early 1890s, he was also sending letters back home and money back home to help his, his family. And he encouraged his sisters and his younger brother to, uh, to come to America, that uh, there was no future for them in Sweden. And uh, this is a picture of Anders on the left, his brother Olaf on the right, taken immediately after Olaf had arrived from Sweden. He was 18 years old, not able to speak a word of English. And Anders uh, helped to pay his way to go to Kent's Hill School. And um, five years later, this is Olaf, when he graduated from Wesleyan College. He became a minister and he served at various postings as a minister uh, all around New England and lived to be 94. And his younger sister also came um, at only 17. And my grandfather also got her enrolled in, in Kent's Hill. She eventually received a full scholarship to Syracuse University and graduated with a degree in art and spent her life in America as an art teacher. Her, uh, uh, his other sister, Anna, came over and married in a, a, an American-based Swede, but she sadly died uh, very young of tuberculosis. Probably the greatest turning point in his life, uh, though, was in 1890, uh, uh, 
a foggy summer night um, off Stonington where the young captain rode in his dory from his anchored ship to visit the nearby lighthouse at Mark Island. And in walking through the door, he was introduced and met uh, the fa Gilly family, Howard Gilly and Julia Mylan Gilly, uh, who were the light keepers there, and their five children. And they took an instant liking to this uh, good looking, friendly, cheerful young Swedish captain. And uh, he, the, their door henceforth over the next years was always open to him for, for a meal, for good fellowship uh, and friendship. And also, uh, the Gillies' children helped to teach him English by uh, comparing the old, the New Testament uh, English version that they had with the Swedish pocket New Testament that his mother had given. And they helped him build his vocabulary and teach him English. And uh, I say love because as time went on, 13 years later, um, he and the oldest daughter of the Gilly lightkeepers uh, would marry, Annie Gilly. In joining this family, uh, they also joined one of the uh, two of the great uh, pioneering homesteading families of Mount Desert in Southwest Harbor. Um, my grandmother, Annie Gilly, um, a second great grandfather, I believe, if I'm right, um, was uh, Jacob Lurvey, who fought in the American Revolution and whose daughter eventually married um, the son of one of the original settlers of Cranberry Islands, William Gilly. And those two uh, uh, were the homesteaders of Baker Island. And they were also raised, they raised 12 children there. And um, the, uh, the father of Annie Gilly, Francis Gilly, uh, married Bathsheba Crane of Southwest Harbor. This is her, about the time of her wedding, we think. And this, we believe, is a picture of Francis Gilly, one of the 12 who grew up on Baker's Island, and the father of Howard Gilly, who became the light keeper. Now, Howard Gilly, uh, the light keeper that welcomed Captain Anderson that, that evening, um, at the age of 17, joined the 18th Maine Regiment and served in the defenses of Washington, where the regiment was turned into the first Maine heavy artillery and um, participated uh, in the, the terrible one month of the Overland Campaign in the spring of 1864 and was grievously wounded in the famous charge of the First Maine on the 18th of June, 1864, Petersburg. And Howard laid on the battlefield for two days in the sweltering heat, nearly 100 degrees. They assumed when they took him off finally that he was soon to die because the, the bullet had gone through his right side and had come out his abdomen. And that was generally considered a fatal wound. But after a couple of days, a doctor noticed that he was still alive and kicking. And they looked and realized that just for the sake of a couple of millimeters, that bullet had only damaged the muscles of his abdomen, but had not penetrated his interior organs. So he survived, but was grievously wounded, was in the hospitals for nearly a year, and was henceforth considered three quarters disabled by the US government. Uh, he told a story to, to my grandmother <clears throat> too, about his youth and, uh, and, and continuing an interesting family connection. Uh, he was nine years old when Jacob Lurvey um, of Southwest Harbor uh, died. So when he was a boy, he sat with Jacob Lurvey and heard the stories that Jacob Lurvey told about George Washington and what Washington was like in person, having fought with Washington and crossed the Delaware with Washington in the revolution. And then that little boy, uh, Howard, uh, when he served with the army around Washington, had numerous occasions to hear and see and get the feel as a human of Abraham Lincoln, who liked to come out to the first Maine because he really liked their regimental band, and they often acted as an honor guard for him. So it was quite fascinating for him then to relay this story to my father and a couple of my aunts when they were little children. Um, it's a piece of sort of connective history, which is quite remarkable, I think. But he came back from the war. Uh, damaged, but grateful to be alive. And this is a photo of his sister, Mary uh, Gilly Lurvey, uh, a few years later in, uh, on a street scene in Southwest Harbor. This is uh, Howard, uh, while he was working, uh, he, he wasn't able to do any heavy labor because of his abdominal injuries, but he worked as a journeyman carpenter and assisting on the fishing boats where, where uh, physical strength wasn't so required. 
he got married, and this is his wedding photo um, in uh, about, uh, about about the age of, of 28. And uh, a few years later, he was chosen to join the lighthouse service, probably owing to his um, uh, honorable record as a as a wounded Union veteran, but also the family history of having been light keepers out on Baker's Island. So this is him in his foul weather gear. Over the course of his career, uh, the Bill Gilly family lived on Mount Desert Rock for five years. I think this area knows better than anything what a desolate posting that would be. And then they went to a relatively much more benign place, Mark Island, where there was actually grass and they could have a cow and chickens. And, uh, and they lived there for uh, 11 years and until they were transferred to what they considered their, their paradise posting, uh, the island in Camden Harbor, which was then known as Negro Island and now it's known as Curtis Island, where they uh, lived for, for another um, uh, 14 years. Uh, some of the stories that passed down through the family about that time on the rock um, were about the kids being tied with ropes so they could toddle off to a certain distance but not go so far as to fall into the sea. Um, the times when great storms swept the, the, the rock and they had to retreat from the house and go into the tower in order to weather the storm. Um, but the houses always always survived and there was always some place to go and inhabit when they came out of the tower. Um, also, the, the ritual of springtime, bringing barrels of dirt out so they could create stone, stone ringed gardens to grow vegetables or flowers. And then knowing that when the, the storms of fall and winter came, they would all be swept back again and they would repeat the process the next year. Um, saw the picture already of, of Mark Island where they, uh, the captain and his bride met. This is Curtis Island in, uh, in Camden Harbor. Uh, this is Mrs. Gilly at Curtis Island with a cat who was reputed to be a wonderful fisher, a cat catching fish at the low, low tide mark. This is a scene of the family and Howard with his telescope. Julia Gilly uh, passed away suddenly at Christmas time in 1908 on, at, at the lighthouse in Curtis Island. And Howard, um, now by himself, except for visits by his daughters, uh, keep him company. Uh, decided to uh, to retire the next spring. So after that, he went to live with his daughters first in Camden, and then with my grandmother and Captain Anderson in Rockland when they moved to Rockland. He died 50 years after his wounding in Petersburg um, in 1914. So uh, on June 24th, 1903, Captain Anders Anderson and Annie Gilly Anderson married uh, on this beautiful island in Camden Harbor. And my um, grandmother, who was a very shy person, she spent her entire childhood on the isolation of lighthouses. <laughs> she had two great distinct memories that she shared with her children. One is there was a beautiful sunny day and all the picnickers came out from Camden to spend an afternoon on the island. And so while she was in the front parlor and in the midst of the ceremony, her, her image over the, pre the minister's shoulder was all these faces pressed against the glass, watching her get married. And then afterwards, when she and, and Captain Anderson were signing the papers, he turns to her and, say, and says, should I put my real name down? And for a second, she was startled and thought, my, my Lord, who have I, who have I married? Uh, because she had only ever known him as Andrew Anderson. And uh, he was universally known that way in America. But he, his legal name was still Anders, and that's what he was referring to. So they had a good laugh. They quickly started a family. Uh, this is their first child, uh, Julia, born in, uh, in 1905. They moved in 1910 to Rockland, this home uh, with an orchard and a barn and a nice place for gardens and lots of friendly neighbors. Uh, they would raise six children there, three girls and three boys. Uh, two of the boys, my father, John Anderson, and my uncle, Bob Anderson, became Rockland fishermen and Gilbert became a government employee in uh, White Plains, New York. His daughters are, more, in a way, a more interesting story, I think, because uh, they always told me that their father was very insistent that they be independent women, that I don't want to have happened to you what happened to my mother. If she was dependent on a man for legal protection, for financial protection. I want you to have your own careers and your own control of your own wealth, your own money. So he, he and Annie, uh, and all three of his daughters to college, and they all three graduated in the 1920s and 1930s, which is pretty remarkable in New England at that time. And I, uh, 
Uh, so any any Billy, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in front of her new home, um, you know, we often forget what it took for the wives and the families of those sailors who would be gone for a month, three months, six months, five months. Um, I remember one time saying to my father, because he was a fisherman going up off the Grand Banks, and I said to him, you know, I wish you, know, I wish you could be home more, you know, and he said, you know, I don't think you've got it too bad. He said, when I was your age, my father was gone for six months or five months, you know, and, uh, and I remember thinking, well, yeah, I think he's, yeah, I do have it a lot better than he did. Um, but who held the family together during that time? It was Annie Gilly Anderson. He had to deal with, you know, pregnancies while he was gone, births while he was gone, um, all the ch all the children's various sicknesses. And on top of that, because she had been so isolated on the lighthouse as a girl, she had never had any of the childhood diseases when she was young. So he got chickenpox and measles and mumps as her children did and suffered through it with them. So she was a strong and tough woman, but she was a kind and gentle woman. And... Um, her family related the story that she would some, from time to time gather all the kids in the, in the front parlor and, and sing, psalm, sing psalms or songs or tell Bible stories. And it wasn't until they were grown she relayed to them that it was on those occasions when she knew that, that Anders, Captain Anderson was off in the Caribbean or off uh, the Carolinas and, was, and they knew there was a hurricane or great storm going. And this was a way she managed her stress and her anxiety without frightening the children. Um, one, of the, one of the trips that Captain Anderson made to Haiti, he brought back a collection of prisoners' uniforms from an abandoned jail. And, uh, and my grandmother, who loved to spend time in her garden, but didn't like to have her good clothes you know, damaged, found that these prison pajamas and tops were perfect for garden, because she didn't care if they got dirty and they were very baggy and comfortable. So this created a lot of fun and excitement in the neighborhood whenever uh, she'd be out gardening and the neighbors would comment to, comment to Captain Anderson, you know, isn't it enough that she works so hard that you have to keep her as a prisoner in the garden? So it was a, a, a fun time, a uh, humorous time for everyone. But she was like so many of the, of the uh, captain's wives and family who kept things going at home. Their children often went sailing with the captain, as did Annie. Uh, this is uh, Bob Anderson uh, at the age of about 10 on the Annie B. Mitchell, sailing with his father. And uh, this is another picture of Bob <clears throat> dressed as a pirate. Whenever the kids went out on the, for the first trip alone with their father sailing, he designated one day where they were given the command of the ship. And each time the kids would dress up as a pirate and with the wink and a nod from the crew, they were allowed to, to order everyone around for a day. So it was a beautiful memory for the children and uh, a, a nice fatherly opportunity to spend time with his kids. We know about his life at sea, in addition to some of his um, uh, domestic life, because over the course of uh, 36 years, 35 years, he wrote journals, uh, these small pocket journals that would fit in his jacket. Uh, five of them, four or five of them were lost. Uh, but we have 31 years of these journals, starting in 1906 and ending in 1940. Uh, by the way, the last book on the right uh, from the corner is that little Swedish Bible that his mother pressed into his hands all those years ago. But he wrote, uh, my, my grandmother used to say that, that he never completely forgot Swedish and never completely learned English. Uh, so when I transcribed all these journals and published them by themselves, a standalone volume, um, I had to get used to the phonetic spelling of his words. And some, some of them were quite clever, but it was all from how that word sounded to his ear and how he spelled it out. And this is, gives you an example. In the front of every book, along with his naturalization date, he would write this quotation from Rabbi Hillel. Uh, if we are not for ourselves, who will be? If we are all for ourselves, what will we be? And you can see the interesting spelling, the, the phonetic spelling. But more than that, this, this seems to me really represented a North Star for him to guide him. He wrote it every year in the front of the journals um, that, that of what kind of person he wanted to be. He could take care of himself, that he would look out for himself and not be dependent on someone else all the time. But that at the same time, he recognized the importance of being kind and good to others, uh, to have a really 
360 degree fully formed good life. Um, we see from the journals and from family stories passed by that his life at home sort of flowed along these lines. When he was home, it wasn't like he got off the vessel and said, okay, now I'm playing on the couch. He went immediately to work as soon as he got home with his own list of home things to do, constant repairs, improvements to the house, getting the garden ready, cutting wood, getting the coal in for the winter. Uh, he was, a, he was a, a bundle of energy. He loved his children. He loved to show off his children. Um, he, he, he went to church every Sunday when he was home, when his children were little, because his children were there. <laughs> but once his children stopped being there, he didn't go as frequently. So the, the children were the centerpiece of his home life. Uh, Annie would always say to him, please do not bring gifts every time you come home, because I want them to be happy to see you, not the gifts that you're bringing. But one time he couldn't help himself. My father had asked him if he could get a bicycle if he had a good trip. He promised him that he would. And when he got back, he, he had had a very good trip. So the kids were all excited to see a wagon coming up Albert Avenue with uh, three bicycles and three tricycles on the back. But that was more the exception uh, to my grandmother's rule. He also did a trick for the kids that was passed down to my father. And he, he tried it on us too when we were little. Um, he had such calloused hands from his, using the ropes and the spars, and, and uh, he actually had to use a jackknife to tear off the calluses on his hands sometimes. But they were very, <clears throat> excuse me, very thick. So he would catch a bee in his hand and holding it inside his fist, he would hold it up to uh, the ear of one of his children and, and they'd get all excited. You know, Papa, you know, you let it out, he's gonna sting you. And he'd open it up and the bee's stinger would be stuck in one of these thick calluses and he'd just flick it off with a laugh. And, uh, made a big impression on the neighbors. Um, he loved to take his kids up on the top of the hill and tell stories and hear what they'd been doing. He loved walking. He walked everywhere and calling, he called it on people. The, the 30 years plus of this journal really shows you a snapshot of community life in a coastal main town in the early decades of the 20th century where before we became separated by driveways and television sets. And, and people would just stop and sit on each other's porches Swap rhubarb for apples. It was really a beautiful window on that time. Um, he loved history, he loved reading. He particularly admired Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt, um, which made him a, a lifelong Republican. Uh, he was a cheerful doer. You know, um, he loved his chickens, as he called them, his chickens, uh, his gardens, his berry patches, his apple orchard. Uh, cutting wood in the woods, and he loved setting up his birdhouses and marking the arrival each spring when he was home of the birds. And um, he was always helping his neighbor with the neighbors when he was home. One of his neighbors had a, a dairy operation, so he would always help him uh, when they were bringing in the hay. Or in the winter when he was home, um, he would help them bring in the ice from the nearby lake. Um, even into his 70s, if anybody needed something on the top of a house or a barn fixed, called on Captain Anderson because he was absolutely fearless. And at 75, he climbed up to the top of his neighbor's barn to, to put on a new wind, uh, a new weather vane. Um, he loved to sled. He'd go up and get his milk with his cans and ride down on his sled. And then he decided he liked that so much, he'd leave the milk and go up and make another seven or eight runs down the hill, even into his 70s. Um, he was always trying new things. In his, in his retirement, in his 60s and 70s, he learned to pilot an ice boat. He took his first plane ride. He learned how to drive a car. Um, you know, he avidly followed the, the early years of the aviation uh, uh, revolution, Lindbergh and the other aviators. I think if he'd lived another 20 years, he would have been just glued to the TV set watching the space race. At sea, uh, he had to capture that remarkable balance between hard sailing and calm. There was no motor. He only, he only uh, captain wind foreign vessels. And uh, sometimes when the wind was right, they, they sailed hard all night and in through the day. But it could just as easily turn calm. And then, you know, they, they set to the other tasks at hand. Pushing up the vessel, painting it, carpentry work, um, painting the, you know, re repairing the sails and throwing out the hand lines to catch fish. Wherever, whenever they became becalmed, they threw out the hand lines. And there was always salted cod hanging off the, the davits at the stern. Uh, he did not drink himself and he had seen enough pain caused by alcoholism within his own family in Sweden. And he had seen enough uh, families of sailors who went hungry because their, 
their um, family, their, their father uh, drank up the, the money. So he didn't allow uh, alcohol on his boat. And uh, it was it, it, it even more practical than that. It, he knew how much an instantaneous obedience to commands were essential in the midst of a storm on a sailing vessel like this. He couldn't have anybody who wasn't at top shape ready to immediately uh, execute that order. And he was known to throw bottles overboard, at least on one occasion with, with the sailor still attached. Um, I think that was in the harbor, not at the open ocean. Um, he would always uh, have his men were coming off the watch when the, uh, at night when the, uh, when the stoves had, had cooled, make sure all the sleeping crew had a warm blanket over them. Because he believed a happy crew, a healthy crew uh, was the way to go. Uh, he insisted on the best cooks. Two things that would get a cook fired from him is if their food wasn't good, and if their hygiene wasn't good. Um, and he, he, again, felt like those men, he asked them to work hard. He expected them to be able to be fed well. Uh, Annie and the kids came to visit. Um, and one of, the, one of his favorite cooks was an African-American cook. He shipped every chance he had. And that cook was very kind to Annie when she was seasick. And he likewise was kind to him when she recovered and helped him with his cat. And, uh, and he gave her a, a ship in a bottle that he made for her, which we still have in our family. Uh, they stayed in touch by, at home by a constant stream of letters and postcards sent by other ships heading in the right direction or by U.S. Post when they got to a, um, a pool. Um, he also had uh, A. Anderson with actually two S's, the Swedish spelling, on his arm, which is is his daughter Marion said she always wondered why everyone's father didn't have his name tattooed on his arm. And it was only when she was grown that she learned that that was something, he was sort of self-conscious about it. He didn't, he didn't like to show it, um, but it was something that had been done when he was just a teenager on the Swedish vessels uh, in the thinking that it would help to facilitate identification if he was ever lost at sea. I guess that was something that the Swedes uh, did. Uh, whenever he was in port, he went off to explore after his ship's duties were done going to the Museum of Natural History, the Bronx Zoo, ostrich farms in Texas. Um, he was just a curious person. And on Sundays, he had a broad view of religion. Uh, you know, he was only in the main sort of Baptist congregational uh, corner there, but he would go wherever the nearest religious house was. So in the course of his journals, he went to uh, synagogues, uh, Mormon houses of worship, even went to a spiritualist meeting. We don't know whether he contacted anybody, but he was pretty broad-minded in that way. So um, his sailing career is expressed through the journals. He sailed uh, mainly two masted schooners out of Stonington from 1889 to 1903. Um, one of the notable events and the second wreck uh, that he experienced was the, the Ida L. Ray. It had been contracted to bring the equestrian statue of General John Logan down to, to Washington. Um, he was a Civil War general. Um, who uh, was to be installed on this pedestal at what is now Logan Circle. And so he brought his statue safely down with the general dismounted and sitting under the horse uh, on the deck. Um, but on the way back, they were loaded up with kiln dried um, timber and they ran into terrible storms, winter storm off the coast of Virginia and Maryland. And this buffeted the ship so badly that it broke the old lumber ports in the forepeak that had been sealed and caused a leak that could not be controlled. Um, so fa fairly soon, the ship was completely awash and all that kiln dried lumber in the middle just started to absorb the water and was bursting the ship apart at the seams. So it, as they drifted, they, reali they realized they were being pushed out of the, the sea lanes where rescue was most likely. So after about a day and a half um, and in this miserable condition on this a wash ship and they had to make new oars for the dory which had been swept away in the storm. Uh, they had to make new oars out of some of the, the deck load of the, the timber. They decided to set out in the dory, four men and a cat. And uh, they spent the next two and a half days in this open dory, rowing, trying to fight their way back into the sea lanes. One point they got within eight, eight miles of the New Jersey shore, they could actually see lights on the shore. And then just as they saw this, the wind shifted and pushed them back out to sea. So when they were uh, rescued, they, they were pretty well done. Uh, frostbite, thirsty, hungry, hadn't eaten in four days. 
And uh, the, the, the only casualty was the cat, which had been swept away by a rogue wave. And Captain Anderson and another crewman were actually knocked out of the dory at one point, but they bobbed right back up in the front of it and the guys could drag them back in. So they were rescued by a steamer coming up from South America, heading for New York. And when they got on there and were taken care of and, and got themselves back a, a little bit in shape after a couple of days, they went exploring on the ship. They found that it was loaded with bananas. So they went crazy on these bananas and got very, very sick. And uh, my aunts told me that at the end of his days, he would never allow a banana to cross the threshold of his home. So when he relocated um, his sailing base to Camden and Rockland at the time that he married Annie Gilly in 1903 to 1932, he would sail exclusively three-masted schooners from thence on, uh, 12 different three-masted schooners. Uh, first with the Booth brothers, mainly granite and coal, and then 1905 to 1910 with the IL Snow Company, mostly lumber and granite and coal to the Mid-Atlantic and New York regions. And then from 1910 to 1916, the Lord Company out of Bangor. And these are the years that he was going to the Caribbean uh, after logwood, molasses, one, one trip, 700,000 coconuts bound for Philadelphia, coal, et cetera. These were the times when he was gone for long stretches of time, five, seven months. And uh, on one of them, he brought back uh, during a revel, there was a revolution in the Dominican Republic and they actually had to hide down and blow decks on the vessel for a day and a half while bullets uh, went across the river and over their ship. And the US Marines came in and quelled it, and started an occupation of the Dominican Republic. And in the aftermath, he went exploring on the, in the Dominican and up in the border or across the border into Haiti to an old abandoned French fort from Napoleonic times. He brought back this French Napoleon cannon, this 300 pound thing, and he set it up on his lawn. And my uh, father and his brothers on the 4th of July would pack it with black powder and rattle the windows of, uh, of the hill they lived on. A lot of fun. Uh, from 1916 to 1922, he went back to the IL Snow Company, mainly uh, getting ship's lumber, cypress, cement, clay, coal, a lot of trips to Jacksonville, the Carolinas, um, and the Mid Atlantic, Virginia the Monkey Rivers, the Piankatank Rivers, places like that. Um, in 1922, he rejoined Booth Brothers. And from then to the end of his career, he was on the Granite South from the quarries at Hall Quarry, at um, Sullivan, at Vinyl Haven, at Clark Island, Maine Granite South to New York, all from New Jersey back to Maine. This made for a much more um, normal home life and uh, he, my father would always say his younger siblings had a much had much more uh, time with their father because the trips would be about a month or a, mo or a month and a half. <clears throat> Some of his favorite vessels, the Livinia Snow, he sailed for five years. A picture of it at its launching day in the South End in Rockland. The snows made lovely, beautiful, artistically and tough, tough working ships. This is him aboard the snow at the age of 55 in Jacksonville. And the Wawanock, also a snow vessel. He was the launching captain in 1907 and sailed it for a couple of years. And then he returned to it uh, at the end of her life. This is in 1907 uh, at its ceremonial sliding uh, uh, down the ways. My father's on the ship as a seven month old baby. Uh, this is the vessel on its first uh, maiden cruise out past the Rockland Breakwater. Um, gorgeous boat. And when he rejoined it 18 years later, um, by that time, the, the trade was dying. Nobody could afford to really keep the ships up the way they had in the past. So most of these sailing vessels were no longer insured. Sometimes their cargo was insured. But in this case, the, the Wawanock was not insured. So it was declared a loss when uh, coming down with 500 tons of granite stone from Sullivan in January of, of 1929, it ran into a snow squall. And in shifting anchorages, they got hung on a ledge. And the Coast Guard came and Captain Anderson said, we just wait a while, the tide will float her off. His crew was having none of that. They said, no, no, we want off, you know. Uh, so they jumped onto the, the cutter and the captain had no choice but to follow them. And, and sure enough, the vessel wiggled free and the storm was blowing it down toward McLaughlin's Island. So they chased it and saw it crash up on the shoreline. But uh, whereas in previous years, this ship was eminently floatable, refloatable. It would have been salvaged, but they, in, in the 1920s, it wasn't worth it. But, uh, Captain John Snow, who owned the vessel, did have an insurance policy on the granite curbing stones. So 
he undertook this salvage uh, operation, which you see here. Bitterly cold, February, dealing with these stones in a, in a sunken hole. Uh, he said in later years that after that salvage operation, he would never salvage another cargo unless it was gold or radium. And uh, lastly, his favorite vessel was the William Booth. The photos that I'm going to show you from the William Booth um, were taken by my father when he was a teenager in the summers working for his father and then um, as a 20 year old, a little bit later in 1927. So they're from 1924, 1927. This is the <clears throat> booth at Anchor in New York after a, a, a major disaster that struck it. They had a new main mast installed and they were coming up through um, uh, Long Island Sound and ran into a thunderstorm. And the, the storm snapped off the, the main mast high up, as you can see. And then it, all the, the crashing materials came down and snapped off the mizzen mast lower down. No one was killed, no one was injured. Um, this is a picture of my 18 year old father standing in front of some of the wreckage and the snapped uh, mizzen. Another crewman with a little bit more of the mast on the, on the deck. And the, at dry docks, these, the workers starting to, to air everything. And then they were towed down uh, the, the uh, East, East River um, uh, toward New York. All the ships came into City Island and then they were towed down through the waterways into the inner harbor of New York. My father climbed up into the rigging to take this high altitude shot of them approaching, I believe it's the uh, Brooklyn Bridge and the Williamsburg Bridge on the East River. This is 1924, 1925. And this is, a, this is a skyline of New York. This is pre-Empire State Building, pre-Chrysler Building. Uh, Captain Anderson ready to go into town on a Sunday. This is probably the mate ready to do the same. This is before the age of uh, sunglasses and, uh, and sunblock. Yeah, a hat was required if you're gonna be out there at the, at the wheel. Uh, this picture of a crewman on the deck and then bingo crewman up in the in the rigging. Uh, this is in the uh, Jersey coal, pier, coal piers, probably South Amboy. Uh, my father is the man in the on the main mast, center mast, um, recreating his father's putting his cap on the top of the ball uh, of, of the main mast. Having done so, now he's showing off and waving. I should say that I did not inherit either my grandfather's or my grand or my father's uh, uh, fearlessness about heights. Uh, this is another shot looking down on the on the uh, beautiful lines of the of the William Booth. And this is in 1927 when my father was working in New York, and he and a couple of his buddies caught a ride back uh, on the William Booth. And these following pictures are from that period in 1927. My father had climbed out on the Martingale while the ship was under sail, and took this remarkable picture of the, the vessel surging through the waves. And as young men do, they climbed up and took competing pictures of each other up in the high rigging. I don't know whether they were absent uh, extra berths on this trip or they were just fooling around, but uh, that's my father and a friend uh, sleeping, quote, in the, in the, in the sails. And uh, here's uh, the example that I mentioned earlier of the salted cod hanging from the davits. This is at the Jersey Coal Piers. You can see some of the rough coal that hadn't been trimmed out yet to go to sea. And I believe this is a monkfish this woman is holding up. These are following photos, uh, pictures that he, he took of sister ships, probably some of the clinks, uh, the Annie B. Mitchell, that were also owned by the Booth Brothers and Hurricane Island Granite Company. I, I haven't been able to zoom in and see the names of these vessels, but I'm sure that they were those sister ships. It's a great shot. And, um, and this is my favorite shot. Uh, this, you know, this person standing at the stern at the back there um, is reportedly my grandfather. So my father was taking this picture. So when I look at this picture, I'm literally looking over my father's shoulder as he takes a picture of my grandfather. And it just such a, a makes me at least feel like you imagine yourself standing on that deck. Um, the William Booth suffered uh, a sad end and became the fourth of the, uh, of the lost uh, in the 
and Father's 50-year career. In, in April of 1928, hauling 825 tons of Vinyl Haven paving stone, granite paving stone, in New York. He was anchored at about one o'clock in the morning in the thick fog off Chatham, Massachusetts. And the four master coal schooner, um, Helen Barnett Gring, came flying through the fog and speared them midships. And uh, the, the uh, booth loaded with 825 tons of granite sank in less than two and a half minutes. Um, all of his crew and the captain were able to get off and were taken aboard the, uh, the Gring, where they must have had a rather awkward few moments. Um, what passed down through the family uh, was that uh, Captain Anderson, when he confronted the man who had been at the wheel, uh, said he reeked of whiskey, um, which might explain why he was flying through the fog like that. Um, but uh, when the Coast Guard came the next day, they were able to find the wreck because the, the tips of the top masts were still visible sticking out of the wall. So uh, the last passages of, of his career and the sailing ships that he loved uh, played out after the loss of the, of the uh, Booth and the Wawanock. He served on as captain of three additional ships owned by brothers or the Snows. And uh, by 1929, 1931, the business was drying up. Uh, even the granite business was drying up. The very last scheduled shipments were from Hall Quarry on Somme Sound to Portland in 1931, three or four different runs back and forth, bringing granite for the U.S. House of Representatives building in Washington. And the last granite load from Hall's Quarry uh, to New York um, was on September 16, 1931. Once they brought it and dropped it in New York, they wait, he waited for over a month to find any kind of cargo to take back to Maine. So they knew it was dwindling and it was dying out, but they hoped to bring it be out the next spring, but that was not to be. So his last act as a sailing captain was the following June, is to take the Annie B. Mitchell schooner and the George Clink schooner of the Booth Brothers from Booth Bay Harbor to Wildcat in St. George, where they went into mothballs. Uh, this photo is of my father and my uncle Gilbert with Captain Anderson on in New York before that last return visit to Maine in 1931. I think they all knew that this might be the last hurrah they wanted to uh, mark the occasion. So after 50 years at sea, 42 years as a Maine captain, uh, he retired and he had, he had eight years of retirement. Um, he liked to hang out with his friend, uh, uh, friend Captain Richard Snow at, at his camp down in Spruce Head at Elwell's Point. This is a picture of it where the old captains and their cronies and their friends would go and work on projects. Build, they built four different camps on this little spit. Uh, they built breakwaters and planted trees and, and had fish, fish chowder and, and lobster feeds. And I would have loved to have had a recording device to listen to the stories of those old captains who were also fading away just like their ships. Um, you know, it's a piece of history that would, could never be reclaimed. Um, as I mentioned, he learned to drive at 69. He and Annie got to travel more together. And this is a shot of them in Stonington with Mark Island in the background where they had met, met on that foggy night uh, nearly a half a century before. Uh, he loved to go fishing. Uh, he only fished with hand lines. He never used a rod and reel in his life. This is 75. And on Sundays, he had a tradition of, of making ice cream after church. So here he is pounding up a bag of ice, getting ready. And, um, and I believe that might be one of the prison outfits that he's wearing. And uh, of course, his chickens. Uh, he supposedly uh, named them all and they could answer to him by name. At least that's the claim that was made by my, my aunts. Uh, but you know, just a sign of the times, imagine a, a, a man feeding his chickens in a three-piece suit and a fedora hat. So the last days of the schooners were also taking place during the 1930s as the captains were retiring and coming off the sea. And in every cove and harbor in Maine, you could find one or more uh, <clears throat> hulks that were graying by age and weather, um, no longer needed. And uh, there is to the point now where there is not a single Maine made, Maine built, three-masted or above schooner. Uh, in existence. There are, there, there are two masted, but uh, none of these old great ships which were really the workhorses of industry. I think it shouldn't be, <clears throat> uh, we shouldn't go on without also mentioning what happened to his, his schooners. Of the schooners that he was captain of during the time of the journals, Methabesic, 
uh, which launched in 1896, which wrecked in Barbuda in 1920. Matinic launched in 1901, lost with all hands in 1916 near Buzzards Bay, perhaps by a German mine in World War I. The Warnock, as we already mentioned, uh, the Emma Lord stranded off Cape Henry in 1915. The Marjorie Spencer sold the Norwegian interest in 1916 and lost to history. U de Payens launched in 1910, wrecked in a hurricane between Cuba and Florida uh, nine years later. The Lavinia Snow, um, as you saw at its launch day, wrecked near Hatteras Light in March of 1930. William Bisbee launched 1902, abandoned in the creek in Tampa, Florida, after suffering the ignominy of being a party boat for revelers in Tampa Bay for several years. The William Booth, as we mentioned, the Leona and Marion launched in 1920, one of the last main built three-masted schooners um, sank near Nantucket uh, 18 years later. And the Annie B. Mitchell mothballed in 1932, it's masted and used as a lobster pound at Andrews Island in the 1940s, later towed to Hewitt Island <clears throat> where her remains still are visible at low tide. George Clink, mothballed in 1932, refitted in 1940, and wrecked off the Virginia coast in 1941. In uh, at the Christmas time of 1939, um, Captain Anderson um, realized or found that his cancer was terminal. And this was an Ill, uh, a disease that had cast a shadow over the last years of his life. And this is his first day allowed outside after being home from the hospital. It happens to be New Year's Day of 1940 beloved Annie at his side. And that following summer, the last summer of his life with, him, with Annie and, and some of the kids in front of his home, he spent the last uh, weeks of his life in September and October of 1940, making sure that everything was set for his beloved Annie. Uh, he got the coal in, he got the wood ready, he oversaw the painters. And when he felt he had done everything he could, he went to bed um, and spent his wet last week in bed. His wife, Annie, would survive him by 14 years and be a beloved grandmother uh, in, in our family. And I think Lord Tennyson said it best to describe the passing of all these captains. For my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the Western stars until I die. And so uh, on October 29th, 1940, Captain Anders Anderson passed below the horizon for the last time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, for sharing that rich and fascinating history. This, is, this has been a great, wonderful presentation. So this is an opportunity for our audience right now. Any of you that want to ask any questions, you can, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and, and type in your question. But you can also raise your hand, um, choose the raise hand feature, and I can activate your mic and you can ask the question directly. Okay, so we have a question here. Um, what kind of artifacts does your family still have? Well, um, spread across my siblings and other relatives, we, we have um, his sea chest that he brought from Sweden. And we, of course, we have his journals. We have some ship flights from one of the other of his schooners. Um, you know, there are, uh, various artifacts from one of the from some of the wrecks you know some uh, some uh, spikes that went through the the deck flooring um little things that were passed down over the years photographs uh his telescope um but mainly you know the things that were passed down were non-tangible they were the stories the memories he made an enormous impression as did annie gilly on their children and so we all of the, of the next generation grew up surrounded by stories of these people that we had never physically ourselves known. And I think that was the greatest uh, artifact, artifact that we would. And you also have an invitation from our Coleman that saying that they will be in MA in late August, beer time, question mark. <laughs> yes, I heartily agree. <laughs> E. Rich, question? So yeah, why don't you serve it right up, Dennis? 
All right, I, John, I find it absolutely fascinating that the stories go from mundane to sort of, you know, life-saving and, and matters of a short period of time. How many times was he shipwrecked, did you say, and did he ever lose a crew? No, uh, he was shipwrecked four times, and it was a point of pride with him and, and gratitude that he never lost uh, a crewman uh, in any of these wrecks. Uh, was, he considered himself immensely fortunate. I'm thinking of that story when they were in the dory um, after the ship sank, and did they have navigation? Did they have a compass? Did they have any navigational tools, or were they just out there navigating on their own yes. capacity? Yeah, uh, Captain Anderson brought uh, a compass, and uh, when the skies were clear and he could get a sighting, he would shoot a sighting uh, with a sextant, I guess. Uh, I don't know the exact details of it. Um, over the opposite crewman's head in the other end of the door. And, uh, and, and that's how, they, that's how they, they navigated. And it was an interesting other little story. When, when they were rescued, uh, one of the crewmen who had lost his mind and was a little feeble-minded to begin with, but they all loved this crewman, um, who he had been in as almost a catatonic state for the last a day and a half. As they were getting ready to be pulled up the ladder onto the steamer, he turned around and said, picked up the chronometer and said, we won't need this anymore, and dropped it over the side. And uh, my grandfather repeatedly said, uh, Billy, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> All right, we have a comment here from Mary Harbison. Hi, John, wonderful presentation. I joined as you were speaking on your grandfather's trips for months on end. How many men were on board at any given time? And were the Booth brothers namesake for BBH? Um, well, uh, the, in the early days when he was sailing, they, they had a, a pretty large contingent on, on, the, on the schooners. They had you know, up to, up to seven, seven crew sometimes. But as the margins became much tougher, you know, and it became a much tougher financial situation, they had to come up with ways to, to save money. And one was they introduced donkey engines on, that would, that would uh, replace crewmen in getting the sails up and down. Uh, that was the only motorized activity, these donkey engines that would help get the sail. So uh, toward the end, sometimes they only had four people. Um, I'm not sure what Booth Brothers BPH, well, I'm not sure what that is. Um, BBH, so just wondering if that, um, if that acronym. Well, Booth Brothers and the Hurricane Island Granite Company was the official name of this company based in New London, Connecticut. And it was a family fam family. Uh, William Booth was one of the brothers and, um, and but they were in the, uh, in the granite business and the shipbuilding business uh, initially. But if that answers your question, Mary, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, Mary says, yeah, BBH, Booth Bay Harbor. Oh, no, yeah. no, no connection to Booth Bay. No. Yeah. Right. So does, okay, so if anyone else wants to ask any final questions, um, feel free to. I mean, John, when I when I looked at this book and I read this book, it is a extraordinary undertaking. How did that fall upon you as the grandson and when there were other children and other grandchildren? Um, other than dementia, um, <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, I always had a deep love of history and, and I always loved to hear the stories that my father and my aunts and uncles told. Uh, so I think there was a natural, natural bent there. And, um, you know, I did um, have a lifelong study of history and, and I, my, in a second career, I was actually a history teacher. But I, I, that might have, you know, revolved some of it on me, but I think it was just a, a personal sense that I was like the youngest grandchild. And, I had heard most of many more of the stories, um, and if I didn't do it, 
no one would be able to tell the story with the same level of recollection. Um, I felt a duty, uh, especially after my beloved aunts died in their in their 90s and left me all of their papers. And eventually when my brother uh, passed on to me uh, the journals, um, you know, I sat there uh, one day thinking to myself, what a fascinating thing it would be to talk to my grandfather. I realized he's sitting over there in that sea chest just waiting to be introduced, you know, in, in the form of his of his journals. And so from that combined with the duty, I just uh, threw myself into the task and and it was really a labor of love. I've got um, two more questions. Um, how do I purchase a book and how long did it take you to transcribe the journals? Um, the Southwest uh, Harbor Public Library has copies for sale. Um, uh, you can also, uh, which I would encourage you to buy from the Southwest Harbor because it also good work of the library. Um, it's also available on, on my on the website www.boneonthewind.com. Uh, but but go to the Southwest Harbor Library for until they run out. And uh, uh, good, good 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 Father's Day gift maybe. Um, and as far as there was, it was a two stage thing. This I started transcribing the journals and I did it while I was still teaching and I was working just when I had time. So the, the transcription of the original journals probably took about a year and a half. But, and then I published them just as he had written them with his phonetic spelling. Um, and then I decided to produce a second uh, volume, which would be all the English corrected and annotated explanations. Uh, so that was, uh, that second volume took another two years, two and a half years. And then I sat fallow for about a year and a half, about the time I retired from teaching. Uh, and then I thought, well, you know, there's a lot more to this story, you know, than just these journals. And I, then I felt like I needed to can, can, uh, gather everything that I had as far as primary research and family papers and recollections and anecdotal materials and put it all in one place. And that's what started this on writing this book, which uh, played itself out over, I guess, about four years. And we have a question from um, Lydia. See if it comes through. Does that work? Yep, perfect. I just want to say thank you very much. I um, have a great grandfather who captained main built schooners in the Pacific from San Francisco to Honolulu and Australia at very much the same time. He was a, a kid in Norway and went to the West Coast. And we don't know. We don't have a whole lot of information from him. That's so wonderful. Let's me imagine a little bit what his life might have been like and what it was like to be on his schooners. So thank you very much for doing oh, that's that. That's great. It's my pleasure. And, and you know, there, there are uh, museums, especially, that have enormous resources nowadays of tracking down uh, remarkable information on, if you know the captain's names and the ship's names and the years, you know, the Mystic Seaport, the Maine Maritime Museum, Tops Cup Marine Museum, and of course your local libraries have enormous resources now. So you might be able to uncover a lot of fun stuff. Thought was well, lost. I've, I've seen things at the Maritime Museum in San Francisco, right? They, so there's a card every time his ship left, you can see when he left and which vessel and where he was going. And yeah, it, there's, there's a lot of digging that could be done. Yes, yeah. No, that's... You're an inspiration, so thank you. <laughs> thank and I'm you also a descendant of Jacob Lurvie, just like you. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Well, the, the, I think Jacob, when he passed away, had something like 70 grandchildren or something like this. So wow. yeah. <laughs> there must be thousands of us out there. <laughs> right, there probably are. <laughs> so it's nice to meet a cousin. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Um, and I think Dennis is ready to sign off for us. Yes, to John, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation uh, to learn about your grandfather, but to learn particularly about this particular period of time, as you said in your book, a vanishing period of time. And we, many of us remember those schooners and backwaters and corners of harbors and sadly see them deteriorate. 
So thank you very much for, for that and to thank for everyone who has joined us for this presentation and continue to um, come and support our, uh, of our wonderful library. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone.